project is underway to build a tunnel under the Baltic. His longest underwater highway tunnel. His longest underwater highway. Beneath the Baltic Sea, engineers are building something that looks more like sci-fi than civil engineering. A tunnel so massive, it's being floated into place, one colossal piece at a time. This 18-kilometre mega project is snapping together like underwater Lego, but at a cost of $7 billion and with stakes that could redefine travel across Europe. Denmark and Germany aren't just building a tunnel, they're changing the future of continental connection. But how do you sink a concrete highway underwater and make it airtight? Europe has a traffic problem. If you're travelling between Denmark and Germany, your options aren't exactly seamless. You can drive north and take a ferry across the Baltic, or you can loop inland through Denmark's mainland peninsula. Either way, you're looking at delays, detours and plenty of congestion. For decades, both countries dreamed of a shortcut, not just for cars, but for high-speed rail and cargo. A tunnel straight across the Feyman Belt, a narrow, windswept stretch of sea separating Denmark's Lolland Island from Germany's Feyman Island, would slice travel times, boost trade, and finally connect Scandinavia with Central Europe like never before. But there's a catch. Building a tunnel under the sea is one of the most expensive, complicated engineering feats imaginable. We're talking about a structure that must withstand saltwater corrosion, shifting seafloors, tidal pressures and decades of wear, all while remaining airtight, watertight and open for business every single day. Oh, and by the way, this one's nearly 18 kilometres long. That makes it longer than the Channel Tunnel, if you count just the immersed part, and unlike traditional tunnels bored deep beneath the seabed, this one is being built piece by piece and lowered in from above. It's a method called immersed tube construction. And if it sounds absurd, that's because it kind of is. Imagine pouring a full-sized highway into a mould the length of two football fields. Then imagine doing that 89 times, hauling each chunk into the open sea and sinking them with centimetre level precision, all while working around shipping lanes, ocean currents and strict environmental regulations. That's what this $7 billion project is doing, right now, off the coasts of Denmark and Germany. And they're doing it because the rewards are enormous. Once completed, the Feynman Belt Tunnel will cut the Copenhagen to Hamburg travel time by over an hour. Freight will move faster, tourism will explode. And one of the last watery gaps in Europe's transcontinental infrastructure will finally close. But it's not just a transportation upgrade. This tunnel represents a new kind of ambition, the kind that takes on the sea, breaks the rules of construction and rewrites how we think about connectivity on a continental scale. So how do you float a tunnel through the Baltic Sea and then sink it without sinking the project? That's where things get really interesting. Let's get one thing straight. This tunnel isn't bored underground like a subway or mined through rock like a mountain pass. It's assembled like a fleet of massive concrete ships and then gently sunk beneath the seafloor. The method is called immersed tube tunnelling and while it sounds like something out of a science fiction novel, it's one of the most daring and efficient ways to cross bodies of water. Here's how it works. Engineers start by building the tunnel segments on land, each one up to 217 metres long, weighing over 73,000 tonnes. That's about the same as 13 Eiffel Towers stacked side by side, and each one is built with the same level of precision you'd expect from a spacecraft. Why on land? Because trying to pour concrete underwater is like trying to decorate a wedding cake during an earthquake. So instead, they construct these enormous rectangular tubes in dry docks, open-air shipbuilding yards, where every aspect can be controlled. The walls, the interior road and rail decks, the waterproofing, the ceiling gaskets. It all happens before the tunnel even touches the sea. Then comes the magic trick. They make them float. By sealing off both ends with temporary bulkheads, each tunnel segment becomes an airtight container, buoyant enough to float like a barge. Once ready, tugboats guide them into position out on the water, 
slowly and carefully, as if they're towing an 18-storey building lying on its side. But floating a tunnel is only half the challenge. The real trick is sinking it perfectly into place. To prepare, the seafloor is dredged into a shallow trench. A layer of gravel is laid like an underwater mattress and laser-guided levelling equipment smooths it out to within millimetres. Then, using lay barges, gigantic catamaran-style construction ships, each segment is gradually flooded to reduce buoyancy and gently lowered into the trench. We're talking precision drops in open water while compensating for wind, tide, current and even the occasional passing cargo ship. And here's where things go from difficult to insane. The tunnel segments must align perfectly, not within a few inches, but within a few centimetres, or the waterproof seals between them won't hold. It's like docking a spacecraft at the bottom of the ocean. Once aligned, hydraulic jacks pull the segments together, compressing a rubber gasket that forms an initial watertight seal. Later, the internal water is pumped out to create a pressure differential that locks the joint even tighter. It's elegant, it's risky, and it's happening 40 metres below the waves of the Baltic Sea. And here's the kicker. This isn't just concrete. The Feynman Belt Tunnel includes a two-lane highway in each direction, two electrified rail tracks, emergency exits, and ventilation systems, all inside a single submerged structure. That means the tunnel's internal shape had to be custom engineered. Circular designs used in traditional tunnel boring wouldn't cut it. The immersed tube method let them build exactly what they needed, with no wasted space. And the result? One of the widest, most complex immersed tunnels ever attempted. But lowering concrete blocks into the ocean is only half the story. The real challenge? Keeping them there, safe from tides, anchors, sediment, and the slow, grinding pressure of time. That's up next. So the tunnel floats, then it sinks, then it clicks into place. But now comes the most delicate part of all, making sure it stays there forever. Because these aren't toy bricks. Each Feynman belt segment weighs tens of thousands of tons. And once it's submerged, there's no crane waiting to hoist it back up for a do-over. So how do engineers anchor something this massive to the sea floor, especially when it needs to survive currents, temperature shifts, pressure changes, marine traffic, and the occasional rogue anchor. The answer is in layers, not just of rock, but of engineering redundancy. First, let's talk about the foundation. The seabed under the Baltic isn't exactly bedrock. In fact, most of it is soft sediment. Think marine mud, centuries deep. It's unstable, compressible, and unpredictable. Boring machines would dig right through it like a drill through pudding. But for an immersed tube, that softness is actually a benefit. Because the tunnel segments are buoyant, they're lighter than the sediment they displace. That means you don't need deep pilings or massive anchors. You just need the right bedding. Here's how they do it. After dredging a trench into the seabed, engineers lay down a precise foundation layer, usually gravel or crushed rock, using what's essentially an underwater hose the size of a fire truck. This fall pipe drops stone exactly where it's needed, guided by sonar and GPS. Then comes the screed a kind of underwater bulldozer that smooths the layer down with millimetre accuracy. Think of it like frosting a cake, 40 metres below the surface, without being able to see what you're doing. Once the tunnel segment is lowered onto this bedding and connected to its neighbour, the real anchoring begins. Enter. Locking fill, sharp-edged, self-compacting rock dropped around and over the segment. This isn't just ballast, it's strategic confinement. Because here's the truth. The joints between tunnel segments are not bolted together like pipe flanges. They're designed to allow just enough flexibility to handle expansion, compression, even minor seismic activity. Too rigid and the tunnel cracks. Too loose and it leaks. The locking fill does three things. One, secures each segment from shifting laterally. Two, provides weight to counteract any upward buoyancy. Three, transfers load into the surrounding seabed, but they're not done yet. Once the locking fill is placed, a second backfill layer is added, this one heavier and coarser, to provide mass and protection. And finally, the entire trench is capped with armour rock, including bands of oversized stones that are deliberately meant to snag and release anchors, preventing them from digging in and ripping the tunnel open. Think of it as chainmail for a concrete highway. And if you're wondering, no, they don't use rollers or compactors underwater. Everything is designed to self-settle, carefully poured in layers to minimise vibration 
and avoid disturbing the tunnel below. So, with all 89 segments placed and locked in by gravity, geometry and gravel, you'd think the tunnel is done. Not quite. The inside is still sealed. The bulkheads are still in place. The lights are off. The roads and rails haven't been installed. Now comes the part that turns this underwater concrete shell into a high-speed highway. At this point, 89 tunnel segments are resting perfectly aligned beneath the Baltic Sea, anchored in rock, sealed tight and invisible from the surface. But inside, they're still hollow, silent, dark. Now comes the part engineers call the fit-out, but what you might think of as waking the tunnel up. Because right now, it's not a highway. It's not a rail link. It's just an empty concrete shell sitting underwater. To bring it to life, crews begin the painstaking process of removing the bulkheads, the massive steel doors that sealed each segment shut during the sinking phase. This can only happen under one strict condition. There must always be at least two barriers between workers and the sea. Safety is non-negotiable. Once the seal is verified, workers step through from one segment to the next, inspecting, connecting, and reinforcing the internal joints. Mega seal, shaped like the Greek letter, is installed around the perimeter of each connection. It adds elasticity, allowing the tunnel to flex with shifts in pressure, temperature, and even sea movement. And only after the joints are locked and double sealed can the tunnel begin to evolve. First, they install the foundation slab, the floor that will carry vehicles and trains. Then come the internal walls, support pillars, ventilation ducts, and drainage channels. Because this tunnel isn't just moving people, it's moving exhaust fumes, storm water, power cables, and emergency systems all at once. In one section, you'll have two rail tracks built to handle high-speed trains connecting Hamburg to Copenhagen. In another, four lanes of highway traffic, complete with safety shoulders, emergency exits, and fire suppression systems. To keep the air breathable, enormous ventilation fans are installed at regular intervals, each capable of pushing or pulling air for kilometers. They're strong enough to clear smoke in case of fire, yet quiet enough to meet strict noise regulations. Every system is redundantly powered, heavily monitored and tested under simulated emergency conditions before the public ever sets foot inside. Lighting is carefully designed, not just for visibility, but to reduce stress for drivers passing through kilometers of enclosed space. Even the color temperature of the bulbs is chosen to keep passengers alert and calm. And tucked into the walls are maintenance access points, camera arrays and sensor systems all feeding real-time data back to control centres on both ends of the tunnel. Why all the redundancy? Because under 40 metres of seawater, there are no second chances. If a pipe bursts, a fan fails, or a power outage strikes, response time is measured in seconds, not minutes. Every inch of this tunnel is built for resilience. Only when all systems are operational, when the cameras are live, the roads are paved, and the rail lines are tested, will the Feynman Belt Tunnel be ready for traffic. And when that day comes, people will drive across the seabed without ever realizing how much had to go right to make it feel that effortless. But even before it opens, this tunnel is already having an impact, not just on infrastructure, but on the politics, environment, and engineering legacy of Europe itself. Because while the world watches the segments snap together beneath the waves, another kind of battle is being fought above the surface. Above the waves of the Baltic Sea, the Feynman Belt Tunnel looks like progress. But below the surface, both literally and politically, it stirred up deep resistance. Because a project this massive doesn't just move vehicles, it moves people, power, money and ecosystems. And not everyone agrees on the price of progress. From the very beginning, the tunnel has been surrounded by controversy. In Denmark, it was hailed as a bold leap forward, a project that would slash travel times, supercharge trade, and finally complete the Scandinavian European Rail Corridor. Support was strong. Government approvals came fast. Construction began. But in Germany, that was a different story. There, the Feynman Belt Tunnel ran into a wall of opposition, lawsuits, and environmental protests. Local communities worried about increased noise, traffic and disruption to coastal tourism. Environmental groups filed complaints over the impact on marine habitats, particularly in the shallow waters near Feynman Island, where migratory birds nest, fish spawn and fragile ecosystems depend on undisturbed sediment layers. And let's be clear, building an immersed tunnel 
is not a clean process. It requires extensive dredging, which kicks up silt and sediment that's been resting on the seafloor for centuries. Some of that sediment is contaminated. Leftovers from decades of industrial activity dumped long before environmental laws took effect. Stirring it up risks releasing toxins into the water column, potentially harming marine life and even crossing into Danish waters. Then there's the noise. Underwater construction creates low frequency sound waves that disorient whales, dolphins and fish, interfering with navigation and migration. In a busy marine corridor, the impact can be significant. To address these concerns, engineers implemented mitigation strategies. Sealed clamshell dredges were deployed to minimize turbidity. Silt curtains and bubble curtains were used to contain sediment. Construction windows were adjusted to avoid breeding and migration season. Underwater noise levels were strictly monitored. But even with these measures, opponents argued it wasn't enough. Environmental groups took the fight to court, filing over 12 lawsuits in Germany alone. They challenged permits, demanded deeper studies and pushed for alternate designs. For years, the project was locked in legal limbo. Eventually, the German courts ruled in favour of the project with conditions. Dozens of environmental safeguards were mandated and funding was adjusted to ensure compliance. But the debate remains. Is the tunnel worth it? Its defenders say yes. They point to carbon savings from rail freight replacing diesel trucks, to economic revitalisation along the corridor, to the thousands of jobs created during construction and the millions of travellers who will benefit for decades to come. Its critics argue the same money could have been spent upgrading existing networks without the environmental damage, the years of delay or the political friction. In the end, the Feynman Belt Tunnel isn't just a feat of engineering. It's a case study in how infrastructure shapes more than just geography. It reshapes economies, ecosystems, alliances and like all mega-projects, it forces us to ask, what are we building? and who decides what gets buried beneath the surface. When the Feynman Belt Tunnel opens, projected for 2029, it will become the world's longest immersed tunnel, stretching 18 kilometres beneath one of Europe's busiest waterways. But this isn't just a record-breaking title. It's a proof of concept, because what's happening under the Baltic Sea right now isn't just one tunnel. It's a quiet revolution in how we build. For the first time, two nations are collaborating on a submerged structure so massive so modular that it snaps together like a giant underwater assembly line. The design is so standardised, so repeatable, that it opens the door to something new. Mass-produced megastructures. In fact, Denmark built an entire factory just to manufacture the tunnel segments, with robotic rebar placement, temperature-controlled concrete curing, and synchronised pouring cycles that could be scaled or replicated elsewhere. This isn't just construction, it's infrastructure industrialized. And that changes everything, because the next time a country needs to cross a narrow sea or wide river, it won't have to invent a solution from scratch. It could order one. From Europe to Asia to North America, engineers are now watching closely, wondering whether immersed tube tunnels could replace outdated ferries, bypass congested ports, or even serve as disaster-resilient evacuation routes in coastal cities. And here's the twist. For all its complexity, the Feynman Belt Tunnel feels weirdly simple. No space age materials, no exotic technology, just gravity, geometry, logistics and guts. Massive blocks of concrete floated into place like ships, lowered into a trench like puzzle pieces, sealed, locked, buried, then driven through like it's nothing. That's the magic of engineering at its best. Because the greatest feats of infrastructure aren't the ones that shout, they're the ones that disappear into the landscape. Invisible, intuitive, and so well designed that most people forget they're even there. But for those who know, every time you drive across the seabed, every time a freight train glides beneath the waves, every time someone reaches their destination an hour faster without ever thinking why, that's the legacy. Not just of Denmark, not just of Germany, but of what humans can do when we decide to go under the problem instead of around it. This tunnel may be out of sight, but it's never out of mind.